This is part one of two covering chapter two, the chemistry of biology. So in order to understand biology, which is a study of life, we first have to look at chemistry and how chemicals bond together to form molecules and then how these molecules work together to create the cells. Remember, cells are gonna be our smallest, most basic unit of life. So again, we need to look at this chemistry part just a little bit, one chapter, in order to understand the biology part for this course. So we're going to start off with something called matter. Matter is just anything that takes up space, so occupies space, and has mass. And all matter, this includes you, includes the table, um, basically anything around us is considered to be matter. And all of these items are composed of atoms. So defining an atom, an atom is the simplest form of matter, and it's not divisible into simpler substances. And there's different types of atoms. So for example, hydrogen, we can have hydrogen atoms, we can have helium atoms, which are, which are shown up here. And in your atom, you can have subatomic particles. These subatomic particles include the protons, neutrons, and electrons. So if you look at the diagram shown up here on the slide, if you find the neutrons, which are the white circles, neutrons have a neutral charge to them, and they're found inside of the nucleus or the center of an atom. Besides neutrons, you have protons. Protons are the red circles that have the positive on them. This means they have a positive charge, so protons, positive charge. Protons are also found in the nucleus or the middle of an atom. So you can see those you can both see both of them, the neutrons and the protons, and the helium atom, which is on the right hand side. And then the third subatomic particle is called an electron. And electrons, they have a negative charge to them, so they have a little negative sign next to them. These electrons are found in orbitals or shells that are going around the nucleus. So remember, atoms. They're the simplest form of matter, but they are made up of the three different subatomic particles that I just went through. So these atoms, you can have different types of atoms. So we already saw helium and hydrogen on the previous slide. So these different types of atoms are called elements. So an element is a pure substance. It has a characteristic number of protons, neutrons, and electrons. So it has a characteristic number of those subatomic particles. And because of this, certain elements have predictable chemical behaviors. And if you've taken a chemistry class or you're going to take a chemistry class, they're going to talk about these predictable, predictable chemical behaviors. But for now, just know that they can behave in certain ways. So characteristics of elements. Elements are arranged on the periodic table and they're arranged by something called the atomic number. So here we just have the square showing carbon, which we're gonna talk about carbon a lot in the next part of this chapter. So we're gonna look at carbon specifically. So carbon has an atomic number of six, which is at the top of the little rectangle. The atomic number is the number of protons you find in one atom of that element. So atomic number, it's the number of protons. In the middle of your square, you have the capital C. That's called the atomic symbol. And this is usually one or two letters, sometimes three. And it represents that element. So carbon is represented by a C. And then at the bottom, you have another number called the atomic mass down here. In the atomic mass, this equals the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So we have six protons according to the atomic number. So this means we also have six neutrons. So six plus six equals 12. And I'll get into a little bit why it's actually 12.01. But for right now, you just have six protons, six neutrons. You get atomic mass of 12 on this. So those are the three main things you're going to have to know for on the periodic table and then also remember what each of these means. So again, atomic number, number of protons, atomic symbol, it's just 
one or two letter representation for that element. And then atomic mass is number of protons plus number of neutrons. So in the carbon um, element that we just looked at, I mentioned that the atomic mass is 12.01. So that 0 .01 comes from something called an isotope. So elements, they can have isotopes. These are variant forms of the same element, and they just differ in the number of neutrons. So a really good example of an isotope is carbon-12 and carbon-14. So carbon-12 has an atomic mass of 12. That means it has six protons and six neutrons. Carbon-14 has a mass of 14. So this means it still has six protons because it's still a carbon atom. But to get a mass of 14, you need eight neutrons. So you have six protons plus eight neutrons, that equals the 14. So most carbon is found in the C12 form, but we have a little bit of C14. So they just average that together, that's where they get the 12.01. So you get a little bit over 12 due to that carbon-14 isotope that we have on Earth. So those are the isotopes, and it works for other elements, not just carbon, but carbon's that really good example. In addition to um, isotopes, we're going to switch back to uh, what happens with the electrons. Remember, electrons in an atom are floating around in shells and orbitals. So we have these electron orbitals. It's just a volume of space surrounding the atomic nucleus, so surrounding the middle of the atom where the protons and neutrons are found. So these electrons are just floating around this nucleus, and they're found in just the space in these little orbitals or shells. These orbitals and shells, they work in certain ways. So the easiest representation is just looking at the shells. So the first shell is the one that's closest to the nucleus. So here we have a nitrogen atom, so it has seven um, protons and seven neutrons in the nucleus because the atomic number is seven, so seven neutrons and seven protons. In addition, it has seven electrons. And those electrons, we put them in their shells or orbitals. So the first shell is the one closest to the nucleus. Like I said, that first shell can hold two electrons. So we see two electrons in the first shell. We have five more electrons, and we put those into the second shell. So the second dotted line from the nucleus. So we put those five electrons in there. The second shell can hold up to eight electrons. Once you get up to eight electrons, then you have to go out to the third shell. These electrons that are on the very outside of your atom are called valence electrons. And you can see that term, it's on the right hand side of your slide up here. So valence electrons, those electrons in the outer shell. So this representation shows the different shells. We have one shell and two shell. You can also represent atoms using their um, orbitals. And these are the more of the 3D kind of shape to it. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on the orbitals, but basically you have um, circular orbitals. You can have P orbitals, which look like little dumbbell shapes. And these are where your electrons are just going to be floating around inside of these orbitals. All right, so we have matter. Matter is made up of different types of atoms. Specific atoms are called elements. So we're going to take these different atoms, and we're going to start to combine them together to form molecules. So molecules is just a chemical substance that results from the combination of two or more elements. So we're going to start to bond different atoms together. And then we also can create compounds. These are molecules that are combinations of two or more different elements. Molecules and compounds, they have different definitions, but um, for biology, I'm just going to use them interchangeably, so they kind of mean the same thing. So these atoms, 
I talked about we're going to take two or more atoms, we're going to bond them together using chemical bonds. So we're going to have two or more of these atoms, they're either going to share, donate, or accept electrons. So they're going to share electrons or um, take electrons from each other, and that's going to help to form these molecules and compounds. So we're going to get these bonding things going on. So there's three different types of chemical bonds we're going to look at. They're called covalent, ionic, and hydrogen bonds. So we'll start with the covalent bonding first. Covalent bonds occur when electrons are shared among atoms. So covalent bonds, because they're sharing electrons, they're very, very strong bonds. They're very hard to break. And there's actually two different types of covalent bonds. So polar covalent bonds is when the electrons are unequally shared. And then nonpolar covalent bonds are when the electrons are shared equally. So some atoms are a little more greedy than others, so they're going to hold on to the electrons. They're going to be unequal sharing. That, again, is polar. If the two atoms are equally greedy or they're equivalent to each other, they're going to form a nonpolar bond because they're going to share all these electrons equally with each other. So examples of different types of covalent bonds are shown here. Up at the top we have two hydrogen atoms. Those two hydrogen atoms are going to share their two electrons with each other. And if you share two electrons, it's called a single bond. So they're just sharing one pair. If you look at the bottom, we have, on the left, we have two oxygen atoms. These two oxygen atoms are sharing four electrons or two pairs of electrons. That's called a double bond. So again, they're sharing four electrons or two pairs. That's your double. Carbon can form up to four bonds. So you can have atoms just bonding with one other molecule, but you can also have atoms that can bond with three, two, four different molecules at the same time. So we have methane gas right here. So in the middle you have a carbon atom, and then it's sharing one electron with four hydrogens. So there's four hydrogens attached with a single bond. So again, these are different types of covalent bonding. You're sharing electrons. In polar covalent bonds, you have something that shows up called polarity. So we're going to be looking at a water molecule. Water molecules are polar molecules, so they have polar covalent bonds. So water molecule is H2O, so that means it has two hydrogens, one oxygen atom, making up the molecule. Oxygen atoms are a little more greedy compared to hydrogen atoms. This means that the oxygen is going to pull or hold on to electrons stronger than the hydrogen atoms will. So this makes oxygen a little negative. So if you look at the water molecule, there's a little negative sign by the oxygen. And that's because it has more electrons. So electrons are negative, makes it a little more negative. The hydrogens, they're less greedy. So the electrons don't spend as much time around the hydrogen atoms. So they're going to end up having a little bit of a positive charge to them down at the bottom. So in this molecule you actually have this polarity, this positive and negative difference on one side of the molecule versus the other side. So we talked about covalent bonding. Our second type of bonding is called ionic bonding. Ionic bonding happens when electrons are transferred from one atom and this forms a positively charged cation. And this electron goes on to a negatively charged anion for this. So you have one electron moving from one atom to another. This causes one atom to become positive and the other one to become negative. So you have a positive and negative. They're going to attract each other and that's called ionic bonding. So you have these two different types of ions that attract and they form a molecule. Molecules that have ionic bonding are usually called salts. So table salt or sodium chloride is a good example of ionic bonding. 
So you have a sodium atom and a chlorine atom. The sodium atom loses an electron, so it becomes positive in charge. The chlorine atom gains that electron, so it becomes negative in charge. So the positive sodium, the negative chlorine, they attract each other, they form an ionic bond. Molecules that have ionic bonds are really good at dissolving in water. So when they get into water, that ionic bond kind of breaks apart, and then you have this dissolving that occurs. Our last type of chemical bond we're going to look at is called hydrogen bonds. So hydrogen bonds are really weak bonds, very easy to break, but if you have a lot of them, they're actually very, very strong. So these weak bonds, they occur between hydrogen and other atoms. And they usually occur in molecules that have um, ionic bonding or the polar covalent bonding. So they happen in polar molecules up here. So water molecules, if you spill water on a piece of plastic, the water tends to kind of pull itself into a bead. That's due to the hydrogen bonds. So water tends to stick to itself really well. When cells want to exchange energy from one molecule to another, they do something called an oxidation reduction reaction. So energy exchanged in cells is a result of the movement of electrons from one molecule to another. And we're going to see this later on when we get to uh, metabolism, specifically photosynthesis and cellular respiration. So in these redox reactions, you have one molecule that is going to be oxidized, so it's going to lose an electron. That electron is going to move to our second molecule. That molecule is said to be reduced or goes through reduction, so it gains an electron. So you're just moving an electron from one molecule to another molecule. So oxidation reduction, or you can call them redox reactions for short. Other types of chemical reactions that we're going to see in cells, um, we're going to go through the three right now. So in these chemical reactions, you have reactants. These are the molecules that are at the beginning of a reaction. They're usually on the left-hand side of your equation. And then out of your reaction, you're going to get a product. These are what's created or the substances that are left. These are usually on the right-hand side of your reaction. So one type of reaction is called a synthesis reaction. This is where you take two things, you put them together to make one thing. So we're actually building something, making something bigger. Another type of reaction is called a decomposition reaction. This is when you take one molecule, so you have hydrogen peroxide. It's going to be broken down into water and oxygen. So again, you start with one molecule, you break it down into other molecules. And then our third type of chemical reaction is called an exchange reaction. This is where parts of your molecules or compounds are exchanged with each other. So we have hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide. So all you can see that your HCl, the H gets exchanged with the sodium, the Na, and then you end up with NaCl and water, so two hydrogens and an oxygen in this exchange reaction. In biology, we're going to see something called solutions. Solutions are when you have a solute, so any type of molecule, they're usually um, molecules that have ionic bonding or molecules that have polar covalent bonds. So these solute molecules, they're going to dissolve in a solvent. And the solvent in biology is water, so we have an aqueous solvent for our solutions. In our aqueous solution, so molecules that dissolve in water really easily, they're said to be hydrophilic molecules. Hydrophilic molecules, like I just mentioned, they usually have ionic bonding or polar covalent bonds. So they really, really like to be in water. So hydro means water, philic means loving. Other molecules are hydrophobic molecules. They actually have a fear or phobia of water, so they're repelled by water. Hydrophobic molecules are molecules that have nonpolar covalent bonds. So a good example of a hydrophobic molecule is water. If you ever try to mix water with oil, 
All these different solutions can have different pHs to them. So we have something called the pH scale. So normal water, it can ionize just in itself. So water can release hydrogen ions and hydroxyl ions, and they release them in equal amounts. So in this equal amounts, this is considered to be neutral. So on our pH scale, our neutral is set at 7, and then our pH scale ranges from 0 to 14. Anything less than 7 is considered to be an acid, so lemon juice, for example. Anything above 7 is considered to be a base or alkaline solution. So milk of magnesia or lye is another good example.